better not awaken anything in me. If there's one thing I made painfully obvious, it's that I love Dark Souls. And Bloodborne. And Sekiro. Ooh. Just to put things into perspective, I did an entire Dark Souls 3 playthrough for like a 10 second bit. If that doesn't convince you, I'm not sure what will. Dark Souls and its brethren are perhaps the most talked about games of our generation. Part of this is due to how hard each game can be, but more importantly, it's also because they're amazing. There's a reason these games have such a devoted fanbase. And with a new entry just over the horizon, there's no better time to experience this series for yourself. The difficulty of these games seems like a huge entry barrier, but right now, I'm going to tell you the three hardest obstacles you'll face in every single entry. Number one, gravity. Number two, the camera. And number three, yourself. And I'm being 100% sincere. These games are challenging, but you have everything you need to succeed. I firmly believe that anyone, no matter how skilled or experienced they are, can play and enjoy these games. Maybe you've heard a lot about these games, but not sure if they're right for you. Maybe you're not into difficult games, or maybe you've heard one too many horror stories. Or maybe you're no stranger to this series. Maybe you played through one entry, but not sure if the others are right for you. Or maybe you've tried playing them, got stuck on a hard area or boss, and put the game down. But every now and then, you feel that itch to give it one more shot. Who am I? Well, just call me Vivi. My experience with this series started a few years ago. On a whim, I picked up a used copy of Bloodborne for about the price of a cup of coffee. And I'll tell you what, that was a bargain of a lifetime. I have since played Bloodborne dozens of times not to mention multiple playthroughs of the Souls games, and Sekiro. These are some of the only games I consider myself to be pretty good at. Well, pretty decent at. All jokes aside, I started this series in the same place many of you did. Playing these games doesn't make me better than anyone, and it doesn't give me bragging rights or street cred. I just have experience. I don't usually make content like this, as a lot of my content is more in the movies and TV sphere. But in celebration of Elden Ring's release, I couldn't think of a better way to share my love with this series. I adore these games, and hopefully, you'll become a fan as well. So moving forward, this video will be split into two sections. The first will cover why you should play these games. There's so much more to this series than just difficulty, like beautiful worlds, fascinating stories, and fantastic gameplay. This section will cover all that, and more. The second section will be about the games themselves. There are six games to choose from, seven if you include Elden Ring. You can feasibly begin your journey with any one of these. Some are better to start with than others, but there's nothing wrong with choosing the game that speaks to you the most. This section will cover each game individually, like what makes them stand out from their peers, some of their mechanics, and a few pointers for your journey. Since there's a lot to cover, I'll be including timestamps in the description. If there's something you're curious about, or a specific game you're interested in, feel free to jump ahead. And before moving on, we need to establish a few ground rules. Now, your first blind playthrough is truly one of a kind. There's something magical about diving right in and not knowing what's on the other side. I'd hate to rob anyone of that experience, and if you want to go into these games completely blind, this might not be for you. I'll do my best to reveal as little as possible, but there will be very light spoilers. I won't mention plot or lore details, but there are some topics, like in the case of Bloodborne, that are impossible to talk about otherwise. But there won't be anything too extensive. And as you'll see, these games are fairly light on direct storytelling anyways. And on a similar note, I'll do my best to reveal as little as possible about certain gameplay elements. There's a lot of these games that are part of the whole experience, like story events, NPC quest lines, and that sense of discovery from finding things on your own. Having someone outline every little thing would take away a lot of the experience. I'm more than happy to let you know what items and tools are useful, but as for where they are, that's for you to discover yourself. All right then, keep your secrets. And if you're someone who's not really into exploration, or if you played through one of these games before, don't worry, I'll put wiki links in the description. I'll touch on some of the more frustrating aspects, like for example, Demon Souls death mechanics, or a certain status effect in Dark Souls 1. But don't expect an extensive breakdown of each game, at least not yet. And lastly, bosses. 90% of the time, the games will let you know what you'll be fighting ahead of time, like with opening cutscenes, the lore, and in some cases, the cover art. 
But rest assured, I'll be keeping many of the surprising ones a secret. This includes final bosses and any other unexpected encounters. And it goes without saying, but this is all just one person's perspective. Most of this comes from a combination of my own experience and watching people like speedrunners who are much better than I could ever be. Ooh. If you sit through this and throw everything I say in the trash, by all means. There's no right or wrong way to experience this series, and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. What matters most is that you experience it the way you want to. Jolly cooperation is a core theme of this series, and my aim with this guide is to do just that. These games are challenging, but not impossible. It's never a matter of if you can beat them. It's only a matter of when. So, let's get this one out of the way. The difficulty is what these games are best known for. It's perhaps their biggest draw, and for many, the biggest entry barrier. These games are hard, there's no denying that, but they're usually fair. Basic enemies aren't sponges that take forever to kill, and bosses will rarely one-shot you. A lot of the challenge will come from, say, placing enemies in hard-to-reach places, or the environment, sometimes both at once. Yes, there are times when the games will have some stupid mechanic or encounter. But more often than not, your deaths will come from your mistakes. Part of playing these games is recognizing where you went wrong and finding a better way to approach the situation next time. Running headfirst into something is usually a very bad idea, and these games will teach you that one way or another. There's always a better way, as long as you remember to play smarter, not harder. The difficulty isn't just tacked on either, it's more or less the cornerstone of the entire series. If there's one single overarching theme in every game, it's overcoming adversity. The adversity is what a lot of people focus on, but what really matters is how you overcome it. Michael Zaki and the team seem cruel, but in reality, they're big softies who want you to succeed. They don't paint neon signs telling you how to win, but trust me, they're rooting for you. Mechanics like stealth let you take out enemies one by one, and in most areas, you can find items to help break through. These games are all about giving the player a tricky situation and watching how they rise to the occasion. If these games were cakewalks, entire swaths of the player's journey would be completely hollow. No pun intended. But the challenge makes each victory all the sweeter. And not only is it a victory, but it's one you earned all by yourself. And the difficulty ties into another defining aspect of these games. The worlds. The worlds are from software draw from a myriad of works. The most prominent being the dark fantasy of Berserk, gothic horror of the Victorian era, and the Warring States period of Japan. And like the works and histories they're based on, these worlds are brutal and unforgiving. Once upon a time, heroes and gods walked these lands, but even they met their end eventually, if they were even lucky enough to die. And while these games are light on direct story, they're filled to the brim with lore. Most of the world building will come from fragments scattered throughout the game, and if you look in the right places, you'll start to see the bigger picture unfold. Civilizations have risen and fallen, friends and foes have rich backstories, and many encounters aren't as black and white as you think. The fragmented nature of the lore means you'll have to connect the dots for yourself, but that's not a bad thing by any means. Our imaginations are more powerful than any storyteller on the planet, and it's fun to put the pieces together and come up with your own theories. Or you could do what everyone else does. Finish a game, make yourself a nice cup of tea, and spend the afternoon binging lore videos. But as fascinating as the lore is, these games would not be what they are without the gameplay. For starters, From's level design is always a joy to experience. Areas are designed like intricate mazes, with different routes, branching paths, and a myriad of ways they all circle back into each other. And it's all so seamless. You'd be surprised at just how many levels are interconnected. And one of the best parts of a new playthrough is learning where each new path takes you. What a thrill. And of course, the level design is only one part of the formula. After all, these games are action RPGs, and the action is a core part of the experience especially when it comes to the bosses. The boss fights are my favorite aspect of these games, and it's where you can see everything from the combat, the challenge, and the lore come together in perfect harmony. While the series does have its fair share of pretty lame bosses, the vast majority of them are incredible. Fallen heroes. Foul beasts. Sometimes both. <laughs> I can't express how much fun these fights are, 
They're the best examples of the challenging but fair approach to difficulty that From does so well. There's few things more satisfying than that rush of adrenaline during a fight and that euphoria after a hard fought victory. And the final and most important reason to play these games is the story. And I'm not talking about the game story, I'm talking about yours. Everyone's experience with these games is unique, whether it's their favorite game, their favorite bosses, or those moments that stay with them for years. It's been ages since my first playthroughs, but I still remember the feeling of getting rocked by Papa Guacamole, even though he's just a speed bump nowadays. Or how I died more to a Dark Souls 3 tutorial boss than every single boss in the entire game. And that includes the DLC. This jabroni is my favorite boss in the entire series, and I know for a fact many do not share that opinion. There's so much to these games that is forged by your own journey. It's something that can't be replicated or even properly explained. It's something you have to experience for yourself. So hopefully, I gave you a pretty good idea of what makes these games so good. Now comes the burning question. Where do you begin? Like I mentioned earlier, every one of these games are solid starting points. I'll get into each game going by release order, but up front, I will say that the best starting points are Dark Souls 1, Bloodborne, and Sekiro. In my opinion, these games are just a bit more approachable for new players, for one reason or another. Dark Souls is the first of the trilogy, and while it can be challenging, it's not as clunky or punishing as its older sibling. If you want to start with an older entry, Dark Souls 1 is a great choice. On the other hand, Bloodborne and Sekiro are much more fluid and streamlined, making them awesome entry points as well. If you want to start with a more recent entry, you can't go wrong with either of these. And as a general piece of advice, the games do get more streamlined and accessible with each entry. The older games still hold up really well, but they can be a little rough in some places. If you prefer a smoother experience, it might be best to go with a later entry. And on a similar note, the boss quality of the series improves over time. If you're more interested in the boss fights, the later entries are perfect for you. But again, you can honestly start anywhere. If there's a particular entry that really speaks to you, go for it. You'll have a blast either way. And before moving on, I should bring up the DLC. This is less of a tip and more like a recommendation. If you pick up a game and end up liking it, I highly, highly encourage you to get the DLC. In every single entry that has it, the DLC takes what's awesome about that game and jacks it up to 11. The level design gets even better, the bosses are godlike, and the stories add so much depth to the original game. The DLCs are often the best parts of the game. I can't recommend them enough. If you like what you see in the base game, you're going to love the DLC. Alright, with all that out of the way, let's begin with the original Souls game. Demon Souls. If there's any area this game excels in, it's with lore and atmosphere. Similar to the later entries, Demon Souls is inspired by medieval fantasy. But there's a sinister quality to this one that makes it feel like something else entirely. The best way I can explain it is that it reminds me of the eerie parts of Lord of the Rings, like the Barrow Whites or the White Mountains. It's awesome. Balataria is my second favorite setting in the series, and I'd love to see a return to this kind of style in the future. But as the very first Souls game, it's a little rough around the edges. <laughs> Mechanics like soul form and world tendency can be very punishing and the levels are among the hardest in the series. And to top it all off, healing is limited. Demon Souls healing comes in the form of grass, consumables that you can either find in the world or buy from merchants. So when you put it all together, you end up with a game that really kicks you when you're down. If you're completely new to the series, it can be a lot to take in at once. But if you're willing to take the plunge, go for it. There's something to be said about starting here and watching how the series evolves with time. As old and janky it can be, Demon's Souls is still fantastic, and every Souls player should experience it eventually. Demon's Souls is a great entry point if you're interested in darker, more supernatural fantasy, and if you want to experience the series from the very beginning. As for some pointers, let's start with forms. In Demon's Souls, you have two states, body form and soul form. There's a few nuances between the two, but the most relevant one is HP. In body form, you have access to your full HP bar. But as soon as you die, you revert to soul form, and your total HP gets cut in half. As a very general rule of thumb, play Demon Souls in soul form. The lower HP looks bad, but think of this as your real HP bar. Any more than this is a bonus. You can revert back to body form using a special item, but due to world tendency, 
the HP gain just isn't worth it. Just to give you a very quick summary, World Tendency is a mechanic that affects the difficulty. Every area has its own World Tendency, with White Tendency making the area easier, and Black Tendency making the area harder. Different actions can affect World Tendency, like killing bosses, or dying in body form. So in short, if you keep dying in body form, that world's tendency will turn darker, making that world much more difficult. Instead of relying on body form, it's easier to grit your teeth and stay in soul form. Dying in soul form has no downside, other than having less HP in general. You'll be forced into body form after killing bosses, so to work around this, you can return to the Nexus and submit yourself to gravity. <coughs> dying in the Nexus doesn't affect world tendency at all and this is a common trick if you want to avoid any tendency shenanigans. There are times where you might want a specific world tendency, but it's not something you have to worry about for a while. Hopefully. <coughs> and while the soul form HP loss looks pretty bad, you can find a ring early on that'll help. In the very first area, you can find a ring called the Kling Ring, a ring that gives you back 25% of your lost health. The Kling Ring is a godsend. Don't be afraid to keep this on for the whole game if you have to. Next grinding. If you need more grass, a great spot opens up after you finish one too. The inner ward. The knights in the area are easy to backstab and parry, and they drop mid and high level healing grass on death. If your stash is running low, a few runs will get you back up to speed. And lastly, the bosses. In general, most demon souls bosses won't give you that much trouble. Some bosses are designed with items and weapon buffs in mind, and others are more like puzzles. There are some real boss fights, but they're few and far between. In most cases, the levels and boss runs will be worse than the bosses themselves. Next up is the series' most iconic entry, the one and only Dark Souls. In many ways, this game is just Demon Souls 2.0. Dark Souls takes the original formula in Demon Souls and goes out of its way to smooth out the rougher edges. World Tendency is gone, there's no health penalty on death, and instead of munching on grass like an animal, Healing is now the almighty Estus Flask, an item that refills itself at every checkpoint. This game is a perfect example of how good the original formula was. Where Dark Souls shines the brightest is with a sense of discovery. When it comes to world and level design, Dark Souls is the best in the series. Unlike Balataria, Lordran is a vast, interconnected world, and it's filled to the brim with branching paths, secrets, and rich history. And besides the world and level design, this game is one of the most fun to replay. All the games are designed with replayability in mind, but Dark Souls has so many options, like different builds, or different routes and boss orders. The only limit is your imagination. Dark Souls is a classic, and if you want to get into the series, this is one of the best starting points. Dark Souls is a great option if you love medieval fantasy, want a vast world to explore, and like replayability. As for some advice, let's start with a common one, the Master Key. The Master Key is one of the starting items you can pick at the beginning of the game. As you can guess from the name, what it does is it opens many doors throughout Lordran, giving you more freedom from the moment you step foot on Firelink Shrine. It's without question the best starting item, and a common tip is to take the Master Key at the start. But if you're a newcomer, I'd advise this with caution. Dark Souls has an intended order and progression, and if you follow that intended order, the game ramps up at a very reasonable pace. But the Master Key throws this out the window. You gain more freedom, but there's a good chance you'll run into areas you won't be ready for. This will either be really fun, or really frustrating. You'll gain access to more items and equipment, but if you're new, you're not going to know where to look. The Master Key is intended for repeat playthroughs and experienced players. If you've beaten Dark Souls before, or are coming from another game, there's zero reason to take any other starting item. But if you're new to the series, it's not an auto-pick. The Master Key breaks the game wide open, but it comes with a lot of risk. If you're up for the challenge, go ahead and take the Master Key, but if you're still unsure, you're better off with something else. Dark Souls can already be overwhelming, and for your first time, the Master Key might be more trouble than it's worth. Next, lore and environmental storytelling. Lore is important in every game, but Dark Souls is where it really matters. There are many gameplay elements that seem hidden, but if you look in the right place, it turns out the answer was there all along. Depending on how you approach the game, it's very easy to miss critical information. What have I done? If you want to go into Dark Souls blind, pay attention to the lore. Listen to what NPCs have to say, explore every nook and cranny, and read item descriptions. 
A lot of this game's difficulty comes from how it presents information. As G.I. Jeff once said, knowing is half the battle, and Dark Souls can be cryptic to a fault. When all else fails, if you're not sure about an item or mechanic, do some research. I link the wikis down below for a reason. When it comes to Dark Souls, a little homework will save you a lot of headaches. And in the interest of saving you some trouble, I'll mention a big one right now. Curse. There's a few enemies later on that inflict a nasty status effect called Curse, which instantly kills you and cuts your HP in half. You can cure Curse by talking to an NPC, but that usually involves a very long walk back the way you came. Not to mention other roadblocks. Instead, a better way to get rid of Curse are to use Purging Stones, an item you can buy from select merchants. If you find someone selling Purging Stones, buy a few. You'll thank yourself later. Next, we have the first of the Dark Souls sequels, Dark Souls 2. Now, this one is sort of the Brita of the franchise. Or in other words, it's the FromSoft punching bag. I'm not a buzzkill. Yeah, that doesn't really describe it. You're more of a fun vampire, because you don't suck blood, you just suck. And cards on the table, I don't really like Dark Souls 2 either. For me, the biggest issue is the gameplay. The game feels very sluggish, even by early FromSoft standards. And many, many areas are a complete chore to get through. That said, it is just my preference. As divisive as Dark Souls 2 can be, it has a lot going for it. For one, the story and lore in this game is comparable to the original. Dark Souls 2 takes place thousands of years after Dark Souls 1, and so much time has passed that Lordran is just a legend. Besides a few loose connections, the lore in DS2 is entirely original, and many of the new stories are fantastic additions to the series. And in addition, Dark Souls 2 is the most experimental game of the trilogy. Mechanics like bonfire aesthetics and power stancing are rad as hell, and I'd love to see them come back in the future. Some ideas are more hit and miss, but if you're willing to experiment with everything the game has to offer, Dark Souls 2 will be tons of fun. Since the DS1 connections are loose, you won't miss much if you begin the series here. Dark Souls 2 is a good entry point if you prefer slower, more methodical gameplay, and if you like experimentation. As for some pointers, I only have one. Adaptability. In Dark Souls 2, rolling is tied to a stat. Agility. In short, agility dictates how many iframes you have on rolling. The more agility you have, the better your rolls are. There's a few ways to improve agility, but the easiest one is to level up adaptability, or ADP for short. No matter what build you run, invest in ADP at a reasonable pace. The last thing you want to do is perfectly time a dodge, but eat damage anyway because you don't have the frames. More ADP means more agility, which means more rolling iframes. Next, we have the second of the Sony exclusives, Bloodborne. There's a common saying that your favorite FromSoft game tends to be the one you started with, and that absolutely holds true for me. Bloodborne is my favorite game in the series, and it's a contender for one of my favorite games of all time. The only reason why it isn't my favorite is because it has some really stiff competition. The biggest departure from past games is the world of Yharnam. Bloodborne has two major influences, with the first one being gothic horror. But as the game progresses, another influence starts to reveal itself. The cosmic horror of H.P. Lovecraft. It's such a weird and fascinating combination, and it's woven together so elegantly that I couldn't imagine the game any other way. The world and lore of Bloodborne is easily my favorite in the entire series, and it's not even close. I could honestly gush for days about how much I love things like Kanehurst Castle, the history of the Chalice Dungeons, or my personal favorite, The Tragedy of the Fishing Hamlet, which is far and away my favorite story in the entire series. But Bloodborne's other draw is something that would define the series going forward, the gameplay speed. In stark contrast to earlier games, Bloodborne is fast, fluid, and aggressive. The gameplay feels smooth and responsive, and when you add the intricate movesets of trick weapons, you end up with one of From's best action experiences to date. My opinion is obviously very biased, but Bloodborne is a fantastic entry point to this series. It's the natural evolution of the FromSoft formula, and it remains one of their best entries. Bloodborne is an awesome entry point if you love gothic and cosmic horror, and if you prefer faster gameplay. As for some advice, one of the best pointers I have is to be aggressive. Passive playstyles tend to get you killed in every game, but Bloodborne and the later entries really drill this into your head. Bloodborne in particular introduces a mechanic called Rally. After you take damage, there's a brief window when you can strike back and recover some health. 
Some weapons, like the Hunter's Axe or the Burial Blade, have more rally potential than others, allowing you to gain most of your health back mid-fight. If you take a hit and see a way to return the favor, don't hesitate. The risk will pay off. Speaking of weapons, one of the coolest additions to Bloodborne are trick weapons. Every weapon has an alternate form, with some as simple as giving you more range, but others giving you a new weapon entirely. Once you find a weapon you like, experiment with the moveset. Weapon movesets in Bloodborne are very robust, more so than any game so far. For example, most two-handed weapons have a unique L2 attack, and every weapon has a transform attack if you press L1 after another attack. Just to give you an example, the Saw Cleaver is a contender for the best weapon in the game. The base moveset is solid, but the real power lies in its transform attack. It has mad range, it deals insane damage, and it can stagger enemies and bosses alike. And the Cleaver is not the only weapon like this. The weapons in this game are not only super fun, but incredibly powerful. Just remember to take full advantage of their movesets. And while we're still on the topic of weapons, let's talk guns. Anyway, I started blasting. Bah! Bah! Guns are your offhand weapons, but don't go blasting everything you see. Don't think of them as offensive tools. They're first and foremost parrying tools. Gun builds are viable, and they're actually really, really fun, but they're a very specific kind of build that takes a lot of time and investment. Unless you commit to that build, stick with the starting guns and don't bother upgrading them. The starting guns are solid. No matter which one you pick, they'll serve you well from beginning to end. Next, weak points. Most bosses in Bloodborne have a weak point of sorts. For example, if you keep targeting the limbs of bosses like the Cleric Beast, you can force them to stagger. And with some bosses, attacking the weak points can trigger visceral attacks. Not every boss has a weak point, but as a general rule of thumb, target the limbs and heads if you can. It'll make many fights way more manageable. And lastly, grinding. Again. If there's one thing I hate about Bloodborne, it's the healing system. Just like Demon Souls, healing in this game isn't consumable. If you run out, you either have to buy more or grind. In the early game, Central Yarnum isn't a bad option. Runs don't take very long, and healing drops are plentiful. But around the mid-game, you get access to a better option, the Witch's Abode in Hemwick Charnel Lane. The enemies in the area look scary, but they're easy to parry and drop loads of vials. This spot will tide you over until you gain access to better options. Next up, we have the final Dark Souls game, Dark Souls 3. From a gameplay standpoint, DS3 is the smoothest and most refined of the trilogy. The series' clunkier mechanics are gone, and the gameplay is much more fluid and responsive. It's very accessible, and it's a fantastic game for anyone looking to get into the series. And if you're coming into the Dark Souls games from a later entry, DS3 is a very smooth transition. Having said that, there's a catch. While the connections between each Dark Souls game are loose, Dark Souls 3 borrows a lot from the previous entries, especially Dark Souls 1. The best analogy I can think of is with the Blade Runner movies. Blade Runner 2049 is an incredible film in its own right, but it does have a lot of references to the original Blade Runner. You can watch 2049 and still enjoy it, but watching the original first will enhance the experience. If you want to get the most out of Dark Souls 3, you should play the others first. Or at the very least, play Dark Souls 1. But it's totally up to you. For what it's worth, I played DS3 as my first Dark Souls game, and it didn't hurt the experience at all. I loved and still love Dark Souls 3, and on a good day, it's my second favorite game in the series. If you're more interested in the series' lore, you should play Dark Souls 3 after 1 and 2. But otherwise, Dark Souls 3 is a great entry point if you like faster gameplay, and if you prefer a more streamlined experience. As for some advice, I don't really have any. It's not that Dark Souls 3 is easy, but this game is pretty friendly to new players. You'll figure almost everything out on your own, besides maybe like one or two secrets. Any other advice I could give would have to be something like, say, boss guides, or hyper-specific, non-beginner friendly tips, like parkouring off a tree. I will say that Dark Souls 3 is almost the inverse of Demon's Souls. The levels are fairly manageable, but be ready for some tough boss fights. It won't be easy, but if I can get through it, you definitely can. And finally, we get to Sekiro. More than any entry so far, Sekiro is the biggest departure from the classic FromSoft formula. Sekiro is the first to feature a more traditional story, and it introduces a bunch of new mechanics to the series, like stealth, extra lives, and a map. 
Sekiro is also the least RPG focused game so far. It's more of an action adventure game with light RPG elements. As a result, Sekiro is one of the easiest entries to pick up and play. If you don't want to get bogged down in builds or RPG mechanics, this is a great one to start with. And it goes without saying, but if you really like the feudal Japan era, Sekiro is a no-brainer. For me, this whole game was just one big Gintama reference. There's an iconic scene from the series that looks identical to Sekiro's opening, and there's similar themes across both works. And as it turns out, Gintama's author is also a huge fan of the game. All that aside, Sekiro is a solid entry point. It does deviate from the older games, but this is a Souls game through and through. The more direct storytelling is a nice touch, and on a mechanical level, it's FromSoft's best gameplay to date. If you love the Feudal Japan era and want a more action-focused experience, Sekiro is the game for you. Now, Sekiro is often touted as one of the harder Souls games, and that's true to an extent. You can't summon any help, and strategies that work before, like dodging, aren't as reliable. But between you and me, I actually think Sekiro is one of the easier ones. I know that's a pretty bold statement, so let me explain. Sekiro feels daunting at first, but the game also gives you so many ways to fight back. If you try to brute force your way through, you're going to be in for a rough time. But if you play Sekiro on its own terms, you're going to be fine. To start, let's get into the combat. Combat in past games is very freeform, where you make decisions based on what's happening, whatever build you're running, and your own intuition. There's never really a correct response just the response that works best for you, whether it be blocking, retreating, or greeting for damage. But with Sekiro, it's a little different. There's almost a flowchart, where most actions do have a correct response. If you understand what's happening and know how to respond, you're going to win. To start, let's talk about the new gauge Sekiro adds to the equation, posture. Every enemy in the game has a posture gauge, and as you attack them, their posture fills up. Once their posture is full, it breaks, and you can initiate a death blow, which instantly kills an enemy regardless of how much health they had. When it comes to bosses and mini-bosses, you'll take away one of their lives instead. Enemy posture slowly recovers over the course of a fight, but as their HP goes down, the slower their posture will recover. When their HP is at half or less, their posture will stop recovering altogether. In very simple terms, think of enemy posture as their main health bar. There are fights that emphasize HP more, like the Ozaru boss, but a majority of fights revolve around posture. Building posture should be your main priority in every fight. If you fill the enemy's posture gauge, you either win, or are one step closer to winning. Next, let's talk defense. Before you can punch, you need to learn how to block, or in this case, deflect. Deflecting is when you block just before an attack hits you. If you played the other games, it's very similar to a parry. When you deflect properly, you'll see a much bigger flash of sparks and hear a much sharper sword clang. Just like this. Or this. Deflecting is your primary defense in Sekiro. This is a non-negotiable. If you want to succeed, you need to learn how to deflect. The timing is more forgiving than you think, as long as you don't spam it like this. When you spam the block button, the deflect window gets tighter. But in general, the deflect window is pretty generous, and you'll pick up on it fairly quickly. And once you do, you'll unlock the secret to beating this game. See, Sekiro is labeled as an action game, but as any experienced player will tell you, that's a bold-faced lie. Sekiro is not an action game. It's a rhythm game in disguise. Start counting. Five, six, seven, In four, five. damn it! Look at me! One, two, three, four. Ooh. One, two, three, four. Ooh. In Sekiro, every basic attack has a rhythm to it. In order to defend yourself against the attack, you need to look for that rhythm and time your deflect accordingly. For example, the Ashina elites have a very fast attack, and to deflect it, you need to time your deflect like this. A quick one, two. Then, we have the Lone Shadows, and they all have a string that follows a beat like this. One, two, three, four. Then, you have someone like this Wolverine looking fellow, and he has a long string that follows a rhythm like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And these are just a few examples. Some rhythms will be trickier to deflect, but you'll figure it out eventually. 
Your timing does not need to be perfect either. I screw up my deflects all the time. Deflect as much of an attack as you can. The more you can deflect, the better. And just to reiterate, deflect, deflect, deflect. Enemies take posture damage on deflects, and you can deflect any attack that isn't a perilous attack. And I mean any attack. Well, you got me. By all accounts, it doesn't make sense. Next, jumping. Sekiro adds a dedicated jump button, giving you another defensive option at your disposal. You have iframes at the start of a jump, and it's the best way to avoid perilous sweep attacks. As a bonus, if your timing is good, you can bop enemies on the head and deal posture damage. Like this. Jumping is also one of the best ways to avoid grabs. Enemies in this game have melee marth grab range. And in most cases, jumping away works better than dodging away. Just don't be surprised if they grab you anyways. I'm not kidding about that grab range. And lastly, the Makiri counter. The Makiri counter is a defensive skill you'll have to buy from the skill tree, but you should get this as soon as you can. The Makiri counter is the best defense for those unblockable thrust attacks. When done correctly, you'll take no damage, and in return, you'll deal posture damage to your opponent. To perform a Makiri counter, you dodge into the oncoming attack. Like this. Or this. The timing is very, very forgiving. Here's an example of me doing it way too early. And here's another one of me doing it way too late. Unless you really screw up the timing, you'll nail it 9 out of 10 times. Learn to love the Makiri counter, it's an essential part of your kit. It's so good, you're gonna start fishing for them in the tougher fights. So, now that you have an idea of what all your options are, hopefully you can see what I mean about the Sekiro flowchart. There's an ideal response to most attacks, and Sekiro is all about responding with the right option at the right time. If they're attacking normally, you deflect at the proper rhythm. If they sweep, you jump. If they thrust, you Makiri. Obviously, this is a massive, massive oversimplification, and it doesn't even cover things like dodging, safety rolls, or the other defensive option you get later. But hopefully you get the gist of what I'm saying. There's a flow and rhythm to Sekiro's combat, and you have enough tools to deal with everything the game throws at you. And to wrap up the combat section, I'll bring up a similar point I mentioned with Bloodborne. Aggression is key. Or in other words, hesitation is defeat. This lesson is so important, the game spells it out to you at many points throughout the game. In Sekiro, you want to push your offense as much as you can. As you're attacking, you'll either be building posture or dealing damage, both of which will bring you closer to victory. Obviously you shouldn't play mindlessly, and you should temper your aggression within reason, but I can't stress how much this game rewards aggression. It's the entire reason why posture exists in the first place. Unlike past entries, you're not meant to slowly wear down your opponents. Sekiro is all about constant, overwhelming pressure. Never give their posture a chance to recover, and never give them a chance to breathe. You control the pace of every fight, and if you keep the pressure on them, you're going to win. And yeah, I know this is a lot easier said than done. Early on, you're not quite used to the mechanics, and it's very easy to panic and make mistakes. But sooner or later, everything will fall into place. More than any other game in the series, Sekiro is the one where you'll feel powerful. And I'm not just gassing you up either. If you're relentless, and your deflects and counters are on point, there won't be anything that can stop you. Next, let's talk tools. Sekiro introduces prosthetic tools, which are sidearms that can enhance your playstyle. While some tools are better than others, every single one has its use. Many, many encounters become way easier with the right equipment, like how the Umbrella can shut down certain fights, or how Saibamaru can absolutely body Fountainhead Palace. Experiment with all your prosthetics as much as you can. This game really rewards you for picking the right tools for the right jobs. And the final pointer I have is about stealth. If you sneak up on an enemy, you can get a free death blow on them. You'll one-shot normal enemies, but more importantly, you can death blow mini-bosses. 
If you sneak up on a mini boss and death blow them, you effectively cut their HP in half. I can't stress how useful this is. Some mini bosses are tougher than actual bosses, and you'll need every single advantage you can get. Whenever you see a mini boss, you should be looking for a way to stealth kill them first. You won't be able to stealth kill every mini boss, and some are trickier to stealth kill than others, but you should always try. Use your stealth whenever possible, it's one of the strongest tools you have available. It'll get you out of tougher areas, and make the mini bosses way easier to deal with. And after 6 entries, that brings us to the latest one, Elden Ring. Alright alright, I mostly put this here as a joke. After all, the game isn't out yet. Any advice I could give would have to be something really general, like say, be ready for poison swamps, keep an eye out for berserk references, or don't trust bald people. But all jokes aside, Elden Ring is looking to be Miyazaki's magnum opus. The gameplay is as fluid as Bloodborne and Dark Souls 3, and Sekiro mechanics like stealth and posture are coming back. But best of all, Elden Ring marks the return of open level design, which isn't something we've seen since Dark Souls 1, and I could not be more excited. Now, I'm well aware there's a lot I didn't go over. The original script for this was actually twice as long. I originally planned this out as a beginner's guide for the whole series, like how to approach boss fights, exploration, and deep dives into mechanics like summoning, builds, and combat arts. I could have honestly talked about this series for hours, but at the same time, the last thing I want to do is make this longer than it needs to be. And hey, there's always next time. I'd be so down for something like, say, boss discussions, or something on Elden Ring. As any fan of this franchise will tell you, these games are special. They're challenging, but there's so much more to them than just difficulty. For me, these games open the floodgates for all sorts of wonderful stories, many of which I might not have experienced otherwise. Thanks to this series, I finally read the beautiful, unfinished masterpiece known as Berserk, and the challenge pushed me to games like Hollow Knight and Enter the Gungeon, which are just as awesome as any FromSoft game. I love this series, flaws and all, and if there's one hope I have for this guide, it's that someone else might learn to love them as well. What makes these games special depends entirely on your journey. For many, it's the worlds and the stories in them. For others, it's that thrill of an epic battle. As for you, well, there's only one way to find out. Wherever you decide to go, I hope you have a blast. And I hope to see you in the lands between and beyond.